Um, good morning, everybody. I, I'm, I'm Chris Noon. I'm the project coordinator for the Leeds Awards. Um, and welcome to this uh, live engineer, live online engineer event um, featuring today Alex Worrell. Um, before Alex starts, I uh, just try and um, I, I know what I know what happened. Um, I'll just um, run through what's going to happen over the next hour or so. Um, the first part of the event will be Alex giving his presentation, which shouldn't last more than 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll spend the remainder of the time on a Q&A session. Um, and for that, we ask teachers to type in their students' questions into the um, chat box. And Alex will then read them out and give his answers. Um, we're booked till um, 11.30. Um, and, and after the event, uh, please feel free to send me um, any feedback you have. Yes, well, Hampton, yeah, that, that's fine. Kids coming and going. I prefer they just came and didn't go, but yeah, if that's all right. Um, so yeah, so without further ado, I'll now pass you over to Alex. I've come off of my screen here. Um, unmute Alex, because otherwise you won't be able to hear him. Um, and let's say I'll pass you over to Alex Quarrell, who um, is the Hardware Engineering Manager at Facebook. So it's all yours, Alex. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everybody. So if you can hear me, give me a wave. Yeah, yeah. Yes, cool. You can all hear me, hopefully nice and clear. So yeah, so I'm Alex. I'm a Hardware Engineering Manager here in London. And I've been here for just over a year now. Um, but I've worked in electronic engineering now for about 20 years. Um, although to me, it always feels like it's not that long ago that I really started out doing things. So the idea today, I want to give you a bit of an idea as to how I ended up doing what I'm doing now and give you a little bit of inspiration as to things that you can go off and do um, in the area of, of engineering. So, I'm going to switch over to some slides now so you won't see me for a bit and then I'll, I'll come back on the screen for the Q&A. And Chris can tell me whether this displays properly. Yep, this all there. See some slides, cool. So I'm based up here in London, uh, but Facebook is a, is a company which is spread across the world. Um, and so uh, we have a lot of engineers doing a lot of different things, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that later because I want to give you an idea of, for me, where it all started out in my engineering career. So I started at a, a tiny little primary school down in Devon. Um, so literally there were three classrooms, three teachers and only about 100 of us kids. But for me, that's where I had my first sort of engineering experiences, doing experiments in science and making things. I even wrote a little bit of code as well um, on, on BBC Micros back then and figured out that I could actually make things, make things that work, make things that move. And so when I went on to secondary school, I really enjoyed and started doing lots of different experiments in science and design technology um, to doing woodwork and metalwork and, and even some electronics. Um, back then and and as I went through secondary um, it was then even on to A levels and and figured out that although I didn't particularly like maths and physics where physics is one of the sciences they were actually really important to engineering and by that stage I decided I wanted to do electronics um, as a uh, as a career having decided that being a three-day event horse rider probably wasn't going to work out for me because I didn't have a horse and becoming a pilot in the RAF wasn't going to work for me because I was too tall. And so that was really when I started doing more and more with electronics and, and I went on and, uh, and went to university at the University of Kent in Canterbury and studied electronic systems engineering. And that for me was really a, the start. Um, from there, doing electronics has taken me all over the world. Um, I've, been, I've worked in different countries. I've worked with teams um, from America across to India. Um, and even now I have teams that go and work with 
um, with partners in, in Taiwan. And so that's enabled me to meet lots of different people, encounter lots of different technologies and figure out even more things that I could do with engineering. But it really started with something really simple. Now this is a circuit which hopefully by now you'd have, you'd have done in science or DT. And hopefully everybody knows what happens when that switch closes. All right, there's a battery, a switch and a bulb. And when that switch closes, you make a circuit and the light comes on. And for me, doing some of that early on made me figure out that, you know, what things got to go and explore and do by building stuff. But I think probably at the time I was maybe only about six or seven years old. And one Christmas, one of my relatives gave me an electronics kit for Christmas. And that I think was really the start of doing more things. Most of which, well, some of which ended up blowing things up. Um, you know, You'll find out if you get a battery and you connect it the wrong way across certain things, you end up with a lot of smoke. Um, I don't think my mum and dad are too impressed by that. But it allowed me to start to experiment with different things, connect things up in a different way, take a motor, attach it to a battery, attach it to a fan, and see if I could make something fly. The other thing that I ended up um, having when I, was, when I was young was my dad built me a, a train set. And so, although most of the, the trains and things you get just simply go around around a track, that's powered by electricity. And so for me, that started the path of doing more things with electronics, figuring out how to control the trains more intelligently, um, building a, a PA system for the, for the stations, so I can make my own station announcements. And so building things, for me was also about making stuff, not just with electronics, but physical things. Um, I absolutely love Lego. And I suspect if I said to you, you know, how many people in the classroom at the moment have got Lego? Raise your hands if you've got Lego at home. Yeah, you see like everybody, right? Lego to me is so cool because you can build so many different things. This is actually a picture of, of one of my early Lego sets. I followed the instructions and built the car. But in doing so, I figured out about mechanical things, mechanical engineering things, how the suspension worked, how the steering worked, and gearboxes and engines. And so when I had this, I could then go and apply some of the electronics that I'd done by attaching a motor to it and figuring out how to make it move, how to make it drive. And then taking it apart and rebuilding it into something different. And I can't remember how many different things I built with this Lego set, but like lots. I think in the end, I even turned this into a bridge. So a car that turned into a bridge, but a bridge that would lift up and down and be able to carry a train over it on my model railway. So ending up building things, making them work, to me was great fun. What I didn't realize at that age was that was actually engineering. And so combination of those things, I went on, built a very sophisticated um, model railway, um, figured out how to control all that, built all the electronics, designed circuits for signals, designed circuits to control the trains. And although at the time it was all very messy and um, you know, the wires weren't very tidy and sometimes it wouldn't work. That meant I had to go and figure out how to get it working. And it's something which in engineering we call debugging. Sometimes if something doesn't work the first time, it can be really disheartening and upsetting. But then if you go and debug it and you, you test it and you figure out which bit's broken, you can go and fix it, you can improve it, you can enhance it and make something even better the next time. But as I went on developing more things, I went from creating things like that to then into my career, creating much more sophisticated designs with thousands of components on them, thousands of connections, 
and lots of different features. And these were things which I, I learned over time through what I learned through university, but also as I started a career in engineering, working with, with lots of other engineers. And this is because in designs, you know, this, the picture I've got on the screen at the moment is an iPad. And I suspect most of you have probably played with an iPad at some point, maybe have one or a similar tablet. And we all think about the games and the applications and things we run on them. But electronic engineers designed a big piece of what is inside a device like an iPad. There's a circuit board in there with lots of different chips that perform different functions. Mechanical designers design that really nice um, case that it goes into to figure out how to make it so thin, to make sure that it stays cool and doesn't burn your hands when you touch it. Thermal engineers have worked on designing the chassis. There'll be safety engineers, compliance engineers, as well as then the software engineers that are writing those really cool applications and things that we use on devices like that. And so when building things, it's all about a system of different parts that you bring together to create something that is there to give users a really awesome experience or to solve a really hard problem. And so a couple of years ago, my team in a, a company prior to Facebook built a very big and complex storage system. So a storage system that stores lots of data and can have that data accessed at very high speeds. And that was then used to build the world's fastest supercomputer. It's called Summit and it's, it's in America. This supercomputer has got four and a half thousand computer nodes in it. And they are like some of the most powerful computers in the world. They got 2.4 million processor cores, all able to do lots and lots of calculations to work out some very hard problems. And the unit that we designed with lots of hard drives in it, when you use lots of those together, this has a capacity of 250 petabytes of storage. Now, I'm guessing you've probably never heard of a petabyte before, but it's a very large number. So 250 petabytes has got 15 zeros after it. So that capacity wise, that's equivalent to about 16 million iPads. I can't even visualize what 16 million iPads looks like. If you stack them up, they'd be absolutely massive. And all of this comes together because of lots of different people that probably studied science and maths at school from lots of different engineering disciplines working on solutions to allow others to build the supercomputer, which is now doing simulations around climate change, around how to create medicines for different diseases and how to design more efficient aerodynamic cars. So all sorts of different applications that are enabled by the engineering that I feel me and my team did uh, to design this solution. And so here at Facebook, we also work as a team. So I work within the Facebook infrastructure organization and we build products that help other engineers at Facebook be more productive. And those engineers who work across a number of teams, so you've probably heard of Facebook, but also Instagram and WhatsApp and Messenger. We're creating solutions to allow them to go off and have an easier day at work with regard to the meetings they have, how they develop their products, so that they can develop better solutions for, for everybody out there in the world. So as far as what those things actually are, well, they're sort of secret. I can't really tell you because they're used just inside Facebook. But this picture here, this is a mural behind my, behind my desk in the office. And it sort of represents all of us as a team and the things we do. We develop solutions for video conferencing so that it allows our engineers across the world to talk to each other and communicate and understand each other's ideas to allow it to go off and create better solutions together. 
we create systems to help us navigate around our large offices to easily find our way between meeting rooms and to allow us to very easily join meetings and have calls to manage our calendars and basically make our lives or make our days easier. And so when I talk a lot about doing things as a team, you might think that an engineering team could be quite boring. Do we all sit in meetings all day, staring at whiteboards and, and project plans? Well, we do a little bit of that. But most of the time when we get together, it's about sharing ideas. If you have an idea of how you might be able to solve a problem and you share it with somebody else, you can start to use their knowledge as well. It might not be that they have a better idea, but they may know how to improve upon the idea that you've created. And together you go backwards and forwards, and you end up creating something really awesome at the end of it. But engineering teams don't just have to be us as adults going and creating things in somewhere like Facebook. This is me working in the garden with my two kids. We're an engineering team doing that. An engineering team that's hands on with hammers and chisels and spirit levels and things like that, figuring out how to build something and then building it. And at Facebook, we have lots of different people and lots of different roles doing engineering. And so our teams here perform, well, my team at least, I have mechanical engineers, software engineers, and electronic engineers all working to build these solutions. And in the process of doing so, we have a lot of fun, including some rather nice dinners and also riding around on a double-decker bus, because that's the sort of crazy thing we do at Facebook. But just as I close this presentation before we go to the, to, to Q and A, we have lots of different things at Facebook and different um, quotes to motivate us. And there's one which I want you to be aware of and to think about as you go forward and do some of your experiments and building of things. We say, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Because when it comes to designing new things, Sometimes you may think something's really hard or impossible to do or impossible to solve, and you might be afraid to try. But think, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Give it a go, try it, try and build it, see if it works, and if it doesn't work first time, try it again. And this is something which I've, I've done all through my career when working on different concepts and ideas, trying to figure out how to turn an idea that I scribbled onto a piece of paper into something you can physically make, get it working, and then ultimately sell it to people or allow people to use it to make their lives better. So on that, I shall stop with the slides and I'd love to hear what questions you've got for me about my career and about engineering. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Alice, great, thank you very much. Um, so Wolhampton, it's down to you now. Um, any questions you have for Alice, please tie them into the chat facility. And as I mentioned before, he'll read them out and give a question. There you go, the, the bit of gratitude for you there, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> I'd rather be there in person rather than over video, but uh, this is the next best thing. So thank you. Then there's normally a little lull when we get the questions started. See oh, there we go. Questions. Oh, do I remember the first program I coded in BBC Micro? Yes. It went beep. And then the second program went beep for a bit longer. Um, <laughs> the, the, the programs then, the programming was very, very basic. Um, but once you figured out that you could write certain commands that would make a sound and then control how long that sound would be and what tone that sound would be, you could start to write a program that would play tunes and play music. And then started to write a program that had graphics. So you could draw lines and shapes. And as you played the sounds, you could start to draw patterns. So for me, that was my first experience of, of creating software. 
And of course, now we're all used to very sophisticated software that we use, um, but the fundamental things are, are still the same. Um, that's really where it, where it starts. Oh, cool, you're already there. You've got a, a, a micro bit and a speaker, so you can play stuff from that. Awesome. Oh, okay, it's a question from Rufus. What language do you mainly code in? Well, so for me, when I started out, it was, was BBC Basic. Um, when I was at university, I learned C and a little bit of C++. Um, I then taught myself Visual Basic uh, for a university project. Um, one of my university projects, was to create a robot bird scarer. Now, some people may know that normally when you scare birds in a field to scare them off the crops, you have something that sounds a little bit like a gun. It's a thing that goes bang really loud. Um, and the idea of, of this project was to have something that wasn't noisy, but to sc still scare the birds. And so you'd have a camera overlooking an area where there might be some birds coming to eat something and a little robot, a bit like a radio controlled car, that had some bright colors on the top of it so you could see it. And the camera, or by writing a program at the time in Visual Basic, to take pictures from the camera, it could see where there was a bird, where the robot was, and work out the instructions to direct the robot. So, you know, forward for a, you know, a number of steps and then turn right a little bit and then go forward again in order to go and chase the bird away. And this was something which I wrote in Visual Basic, which I taught myself at the time by reading books and, and reading online. Um, again, another little, you know, fun engineering project, um, which actually you may be able to do a similar thing if you've used um, Lego Mindstorms and things like that. Some of the robot programming you may have done or may get a chance to do at school. It's a really cool way of doing that sort of, that sort of thing. And then since then I went on and also uh, learned Java. Uh, which I use for, for applications that I write myself. Um, there are lots and lots of different programming languages uh, that you discover as, as you get older. In engineering, um, in hardware engineering, C and C++ is used a lot. Um, in software applications and things like that, there are other, applications, uh, other languages now like Swift. Um, and here at uh, Facebook, uh, we use a number of different languages, some of which are actually developed by Facebook. I imagine some frantic typing going on now. We're testing how fast your teacher can type. Yeah. <laughs> so a petabit, petabyte. Was it a petabyte? Yeah. What's peta some for then? So capacities, I notice on here, so only recognize terabytes. You normally start at, you have bytes. Yep. Kilobytes. So a kilo is a thousand. Um, you then go on to megabytes, which is a million. You go on to gigabytes, terabytes, and then you get to petabytes. So a petabyte is a quadrillion. That's like a very big number. It is. Uh, and after and after petabytes, you get exabytes. Oh wow! So it's even even bigger one. Okay. Oh yeah, keeps going. <laughs> okay, I got a question from Billy. Well, let's go in a bit deep. So when created React JavaScript, did it make it easy to make messenger apps and communication tools? We have been learning about adding binary when Facebook created. So one of the things that um, the teams do here in Facebook is 
they will create our own variants of certain programming languages to improve them and make them better for our uh, for our applications and so part of it is about making it easier for software engineers to write the code and to make applications which are less likely to have bugs in them um, but it's also to get some of these applications working at scale um, facebook has about 2.8 billion back to big numbers again 2.8 billion customers um, and we want to make sure that everybody has um, the best experience on those apps and so we we've modified some of the programming languages in order to um, make make the apps less buggy or attempt to make them less buggy um, but with with a lot of software and again it says you've been learning about adding binary yeah binary is something which is really important in um, in electronics um, and then software that runs on top of it because computers use binary um, data is stored in binary calculations are done in binary even if the numbers you see are, are normal um, integers and decimal numbers um, under the covers it's all being done in binary so um, there's a there's an engineering joke your teacher can explain later um, there are one zero types of people in the world those that understand binary and those that don't it's a bad joke Oh, cool, you made your own binary converters. Cool. Well, what was, okay, it's a question from Zach. So what was the supercomputer summit actually used for? Well, if you get a chance uh, at some point, you can, you can research summit uh, on Wikipedia and it will tell you a little bit about it. Um, but some of the things that are being done are around climate simulations um to understand how 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 the weather patterns are working around the world and then given our, our concern around climate change and things uh, a supercomputer like summit can simulate the, the the conditions across the world it's also being used for medical applications so we know there are different diseases in the world that are today very difficult to treat some are even incurable and so by using the supercomputer, it's about trying to find new medicines uh, that, that can help to either improve or cure those diseases. And these are very, very complex calculations and simulations, or they have the ability to run lots and lots and lots of different simulations to try lots of different paths rather than trying just one thing and ending up taking a long time to find the answer. You can run millions of these calculations at the same time. To try and get to a, to a solution quicker but i would say go and have a look online and, and understand a little bit more about what it does Does anybody have an engineering problem that they're trying to figure out and figure out how to get something working? Okay, question from Hugh. How do you prevent all the hackers from the messaging apps? Oof. Well, I would say that is a little bit outside my area. Uh, because I, I work on on hardware um, but what I can say is that Facebook has thousands of engineers literally thousands of engineers that work on our products to work to make them as safe as possible because there are always people that are trying to hack into um, our systems our apps and use them for purposes that they weren't intended for so Always be always be careful when using the internet and know and understand who you're talking to. Um, but certainly, we look to try and make our products as safe as uh, possible for everybody. So 
Oh, okay. A question from from Mr. Clark. We have a model railway club. Should we use digital or analog control? Wow. So when I built my, when I had my first train set, because at the time it was just a train set with a track going round and not doing much else, um, it was definitely analog. Nothing else existed. And even when I then built a, a larger um, model railway, which you saw a little bit of in, in my slides, um, it was all analog. Um, because digital didn't really exist. It, what was around was very expensive at the time. Um, so I had no choice but to build analog. That was really easy for me to then go and build circuits with relays and switches and, and bulbs and all of that. And probably I learned more electronics as a result. Um, but now I would say go digital. Um, I do have a engage model railway in my garage albeit i haven't had a chance to do much with it recently and that's all digital um, and i like that because i've actually written a computer program that can control it from my laptop uh, so it actually allows me to go and develop software to do things on there so um, i would say have a bit of both maybe that's the best answer have two have one that's digital and one that's not there you go how about that I I've had a question from Mrs. Marshall there at um, Walhampton. Could you send me the um, the last um, the quote on that last uh, page of your last slide of your presentation? Because uh, Walhampton would like it. Is that okay? Uh, the the picture. Yeah, the, just just the, the the quote. Okay, the quote. So the quote is: "What would you do if you weren't afraid?" Okay, question. Um, how do you continue to learn new things now you're not at school? So that's a really good question. Um, so I still say I learn something new every day. Right? And it was something that when I first started out as an engineer, when I, when I graduated from university and started my first job, the company I worked for I went in, shared an office with a really senior guy and he knew lots of stuff about lots of things. And I was just like, oh, these other people, they know so much. I've just started out. How can I possibly go off and design things with them? They're just going to be like so much better than me. But what I figured out in my first sort of year there was when I was working on new designs, I was learning about new technologies that were going to be incorporated into that design. And because that technology was new, even that experienced person that had been doing this for years didn't know anything about it because it was new. So I could go and learn about that technology at the same time that they were. I could go and become an expert in that um, at the same time they did. And so it allowed me to go and start doing things um, with more confidence because it sort of leveled the, the, the playing field between what they could do and what I could do. And so this is something now, whenever working on something new, I can learn about it by going and researching it on the internet. I can learn about it by downloading a data sheet for a component, actually reading the manual, understanding how a chip works, how to program it. Um, sometimes there are you know, conferences, training courses I go on, but most of the time, because the things we're working on are new technology, sometimes things that nobody's done before nobody's built before you learn from reading um, but also you learn from your colleagues the people you work with the other members of the team that have maybe done some things before um, and you learn by experimenting try and build the thing build a prototype find out how well it works and then refine it um, that's all learning and that's something which i still feel we do every day And that was from Esther and Yasmin. Thank you. Ah. Yep, <clears throat> that's fine. Uh, it's, it's the top of the hour. I guess you're swapping lessons. Then um, 
I hope it's been useful to everybody. It's been great talking to you and uh, hey, have an, an amazing day. Yeah, so thank you. Make some awesome stuff. Thank you, Wolverhampton, and thank you, Alice. Thank you very much. It was brilliant. Thank you, mate. Um, no I'll speak to you soon. Uh, so I'll close okay. the meeting down, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See you all later.